I think the, the issue of Jewish peoplehood is a very complicated issue. What makes it complicated is that uh, one has to see this really in terms of a historical development. There's very little question that uh, the origins of the Jewish people is uh, not clear. I mean, there's this um, theory of the Habiru, Hapiru, and that is those people who across, go across. Um, there's some hypotheses that claim that whoever were the Jews or the, because first of all, the word Jew, you couldn't refer to them in terms of the ancient biblical texts, you know. I mean, you have Ivri, you have Hebrew, right? Uh, you have Israelite, so you don't even have a proper term by which you can actually clearly de delineate what you mean by the Jewish people. And uh, so there's a group, for example, there's some theories that say that actually there was a group that were in Canaan, then actually had to go to, into Egypt and with this longing to return to Canaan. And so that actually the Exodus was in large measure a return to what uh, was already their uh, territory. And so the, the, it's not clear. I mean, I would think that it's not clear. Secondly, you're not really dealing with people. In those days, what you were dealing with was, uh, uh, in, in especially if you look at the, a wandering Aramean was my father. So what you had was groups of people who were constantly moving from place to place. They weren't really settled in that sense. And so uh, I would say that the concept of peoplehood is ultimately an achievement, not a fact. And if you look at it as an achievement, then you have to ask yourself, what are the elements that uh, contributed to that achievement? And here I would say that the absolutely indispensable element in that achievement is the recognition in the history of the Jewish people and in the history of Israel that somehow something happened where uh, the patriarchs, namely Abraham, that he in some respects is the origin of this people. In what sense is he the origin of the people? In the sense that he, if you look at, at Genesis 12, that he actually uh, separated himself from a much larger civilization and so that when you have in the 12th chapter of Genesis, Lech Lecha, Me'artzecha, Mimoledetcha, go, you know, get out, get out, get out. Or, and in a way, go to yourself, go to your true self, you know, from your land, from your birthplace, from the house of your father, and be a blessing. Now, in that respect, the origin of the Jewish people is that they were given a task. And that task was given to Abraham. And the fact that it says that all the families of the earth shall be blessed through you and your seed. And that constituted originally the concept of mission. Not, namely, you're not just any ordinary people. You're not just a people who is interested in having a lot of land or having property or having wealth or having power or having uh, dominion. In that sense, what's interesting is that uh, uh, Abraham was the first hero because of an idea. And the idea is to be a blessing. Now that is something that, at least in the reconstruction of the history, was seen as his being picked out by God for that task. Now, what came out of that was the patriarchs, and then it's a family. Then these patriarchs emerged into tribes when Jacob has, you know, the, the children of Jacob. Uh, and Jacob also has the name Israel. It's interesting because you ask yourself the question, why is it when Avram's name is changed to Abraham and Sarai's name is changed to Sarah, when Jacob's name is changed to Israel, it seems that it doesn't stick. In other words, you look at the text and in some places uh, um, Jacob is referred to as Yaakov and in other places he's referred to as Yisrael. Now, 
So in a way, well, of some interpretations, I think, for example, Casuto's interpretation says that the Yaakov part is really the, the, the physical people part. Israel is the spiritual religious part. But there's no way of viewing the Jewish people in either one or the other without somehow uh, acknowledging both. Now, from these tribes, you then have a king, you have the, the rise of monarchy, and then you have uh, a, a nation, as it were, right? But even here, uh, this nation is supposed to be a uh, mamlecha kohanim v'goy kadosh, which is um, a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. So to speak of being a nation without having a task or a purpose is simply in incomprehensible. And that's why I think later in the, in, the, in, the, in the 19th century, when you had what you would call secular Zionism, that is uh, largely, and I'll go into this, largely because of the massive persecutions and this displacement of Jews in so many different countries, that they, they came to the conclusion that we really are aliens. We're not treated properly. We have no security. We have no guarantee that we can survive. We've got to find some way. And of course, in the 19th century, it was the age of nationalism. Keep in mind, Italy became a nation in 1860, you know, it's in Germany. Because all that, what I'm saying is that uh, this became the solution to a problem that was basically a religious problem. And it's a solution that ultimately never held because the reality is that even the most secular Zionists uh, feel that there's something to the land of Israel that's more than just one piece of property where people can live. Uh, they, they also have a sense that there's something there that has to be respected. So the concept of peoplehood, it seems to me, is something that is something that developed over time. Now, there are some interesting things about this. The first thing is that you had a separation of the northern and southern kingdom, right? Uh, when Rehoboam uh, refused to accept really meaningful advice, and you had a, a revolution, and you had basically a division between the northern and the southern kingdom. Then you had the destruction of the northern kingdom, uh, yes. and then later the destruction of the southern kingdom, and the, the people went into exile. Now, the thing that's interesting here is that this very people that went into exile in Babylonia, a large part of them, not all of them, in fact, the majority did not return, but enough returned, so this is the first people in history who actually was captured and driven out that returned. So then you have to ask yourself, well, why did they return? Why is there, is there something to this, this Jerusalem, this uh, Israel, that is more than just what we would normally call uh, a piece of land? And here, I think, you have such prophetic statements that it says, you know, out of Zion shall go forth the teaching and the, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation. Somehow, this nation had to be a nation that had to set the pattern for justice and peace for the world. And here it, it becomes the greatest irony, it seems to me, of Jewish existence. That on the one hand, we are a people that we feel that we've been chosen by God uh, to stand for all that is noble and true and uh, meaningful in life. And yet, our experience has been that we have been the most nation that has suffered the most. Mm. How do you put those two things together? And that constitutes one of the great, great perplexities and difficulties of, of Jewish existence. Now, it's interesting because in large measure the Jewish people viewed itself as a people that gave to the world that which the world needed by way of monotheism. And I don't think that one, 
I really don't think one understands monotheism unless it's seen in the context of the environment out of which it arose. And that is the environment out of which it arose was an environment of idolatry, not just paganism. It isn't just many gods. And what do I mean by idolatry? It means that the actual values that were involved in the surrounding nations were values that manifested themselves in violence, in aggrandizement. When you had kings, for example, uh, saying that they were gods and being gods, therefore they could act with impunity and do whatever they wanted. In other words, monotheism and the Jewish people had to become a witness against idolatry. Now, that became a very difficult situation. And, and what made it difficult, it seems to me, is that uh, yeah. I think what made it most difficult is that here they were to bear witness to monotheism, but bearing witness to monotheism actually made them reprehensible in the eyes of every surrounding people. And so the whole point of Jewish peoplehood is how do you balance on the one hand this real deep feeling that there's something special about Jerusalem, there's something special about the land of Israel, but also it, it ultimately has to be subservient to what is really the essence of that, which is to be a witness to God. In fact, when you look at even in Second Isaiah, when it says, you are my witnesses that I am God, who's going to actually be the witness so that the world will understand what monotheism means. And I'll conclude speaking about the Jewish people by trying to indicate what that is. What monotheism really means, as Hermann Cohn pointed out, is not that you don't have many gods. It's that you don't have many peoples. The concept of monotheism is indissoluble with the concept of humanity. It's indissoluble with the concept of world peace. Because if you have one God, one world, one humanity, every human being having an intrinsic dignity. Well, so why is it, for example, that out of this people and out of this context, you have the Sabbath, the concept of the Sabbath, that each person is in control of his or her time, the concept of the, for, the forgotten sheep, concern for the poor, the stranger, the widow, the orphan, etc. And so this is what ultimately the Jewish peoplehood is all about.